Welcome back, everybody. This is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. All right, we got some more 2A news for you. Uh, this comes out of Delaware, and this particular article comes from our friends at The Truth About Guns. Uh, we are going to get into this when it's called Knock Knock. Video shows ATF Straw Purchase Task Force asking to see Delaware man's guns. And this comes out uh, July 19th, 2022. Before we get started, I would like to thank our friends at Sonoran Desert Institute for supporting our videos. If you're looking for a career in gunsmithing technology, they are definitely your go-to people. They have amazing programs, amazing instructors, uh, wonderful gunsmithing programs. Their reloading program is excellent. Uh, if you're looking for higher education in the way of gun technology, definitely look into them. SDI, Sonoran Desert Institute, and tell them we sent you. You can find a link down in the description box below. Get yourself some uh, some edumacation, if you will. All right. Dan Zimmerman and Lee Williams. The homeowner was alerted that there were trespassers on his property by motion detectors outside his front door. A live video feed from his doorbell camera showed three armed men wearing tactical vests, T-shirts, and jeans. Two appeared to be ATF agents. The third was a Delaware State Police Trooper. None wore body cameras. The homeowner, who did not want his name used in this story, is a small businessman, a law-abiding citizen who even ATF acknowledged had done nothing wrong. He went to his front door hesitantly. He left his doorbell camera running to record the encounter. Um, that's a very smart idea on his part. You should always record any type of encounters that you have with law enforcement, especially when they come to your home and, uh, and things like that, and especially if they don't have a dang warrant. Okay, like... Police, agents, whatever, they will occasionally make contact with people. But anyway, I digress. We, we will get into this as we go. The homeowner confronted the three men before they checked the door. Can I help you? He asked, stepping onto the porch. The older ATF agent told him they were assigned to a task force investigating straw purchases. A straw purchase, which is a federal felony, occurs when someone buys a firearm on, on behalf of another person who is unable to legally purchase the firearm themselves. The agent said they were verifying that people who bought multiple firearms still had the guns in their possession. The homeowner had bought seven firearms since January 2022. He asked the men for identification, which the agents and the trooper produced. They admitted that they did not have a search warrant. Hmm. The doorbell camera recorded what happened next. All right, so now we're, we're reading uh, the exact conversation that occurred. And before we get into the conversation and, and, what, what, and what this entails... You know, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, I've, I've been contacted by the FBI, all right? I got a visit from the FBI about all this January 6th horse crap. And, of course, without getting... That's a whole other video, and, and, and I didn't really want to, like, get into that in this particular video. But, the, but seeing the, the, the footage reminded me of the footage that I captured uh, of the conversation that I had with the, uh, with the FBI. And, of course... You know, they're always going to try to play the good cop thing and say, oh, well, you know, my boss just sent me out here. Oh, it's an inconvenience. And look, it very well could just be an inconvenience where they're being told to go do a job and they don't really, you know, believe in what they're doing or, or understand why they're doing it, but they're just following orders, essentially. Now, of course, that's not an excuse. Uh, however, um, if they don't have a warrant, you don't have to talk to them, okay? You can, you can totally just not answer the door. You can, you know... You can ignore them if they don't have a warrant, but it's also one of those things where, you know, if you don't, what are they going to do? They're going to come back with a warrant, and then what? And then they're going to freaking rummage through your whole house? I mean, this is a terrible situation, and I disagree with, with everything that's happening with this sort of stuff, and we are going to dive into this a bit deeper as we go. Okay, so Agent 1, all I'm doing is verifying that you have it. You got two different purchases. If you have them, I'm out of here. That's how quick it is. Yeah. Do you have them with you by any chance? The homeowner. They're in my safe. Agent one. If you can unload them and bring them out, we can go out to your foyer here, check them out, write the serial numbers, and we're out of here. <laughs> the homeowner. That's it. Agent one. Yep. Agent two. That's it. It will take five seconds. Trooper. Okay. Okay. The reason we're out here is obviously gun violence is at an uptick. We want to make sure we've been having a lot of issues with straw purchases. One of the things, indicators we get, is someone making a large gun purchase, and then a lot of times we've been there and, oh, those guns got taken. 
Agent 1, the idea is that when you purchase more than two guns at a time, it generates a multiple sales report, and it comes to us, and we have to check them out. That's all this is. You did nothing wrong, absolutely zero. I noticed you were stopped in Philly, though, with one of your guns. Trooper, we'll wait here if you feel more comfortable. All right, well, that's cool. At least they're trying to put the person at ease. I mean, at least they're not showing up, you know, with with a, with an MRAP full of guys in SWAT gear and kicking in your door and shooting your dogs over 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 a multi, okay? Homeowner, I'm okay. I just, I didn't expect. Agent one, oh no, it just came up. We came here, look, I'm telling you, there's an email from the federal side saying, can you make sure this guy's got his guns? If you recently purchased a whole bunch of guns, if we can look at them and just scratch them off. The homeowner, I have them all. Agent two, we can look at them and write which ones you just bought <laughs> so we can save a trip from coming back. We'll confirm that you have them. The homeowner agreed to get the firearms, close the front door while the agents remained on the front porch, unaware that they were being recorded. Trooper, he doesn't believe we're cops. Agent one, I don't blame him. Mm-hmm. The homeowner retrieved one rifle. The agent checked the serial number off of his list. So he had a list with the serial numbers on it. Now, there's been a lot of conjecture floating around about whether or not the ATF is, is you know, you know, running this, this registry. And so this particular situation, when you, when you purchase more than one handgun within a certain amount of time, the gun store has to do a multi-form if you purchase multiple, multiple pistols primarily. I don't think they have to do it for shotguns or rifles, but if you purchase, let's say, a shotgun, a rifle, and two pistols, it's multiple handguns. What they're trying to do is they're worried about people trafficking those pistols because, you know, it is a known thing that sometimes, you know, people will go in and buy 12 Glocks in, in, in one sitting or something or 12 pistols and then go sell them out on the street for an inflated amount of money over what they paid for them. And they'll usually get like a girlfriend or a spouse or some unaffiliated person to do the paperwork right. So, you know, that's the reasoning. Now, it's it's someone someone can do whatever they want with their own property. That's their prerogative. That's their business, right? What they want to do with their property. But where the issue is, is that if you're selling a gun to somebody that you know is not supposed to have a gun, that's where the issue is. And that's the kind of stuff they're, they're trying to look for. So I can sort of understand that maybe a little bit. Um, but that's why they had the serial number. So if they showed up with a, with, with a multi form, with a copy of the multi from the FFL that has the make model serial number, is it weird that they're coming to your house and saying, hey, we want to verify you have these guns? I've gotten a call myself from the ATF. Uh, I got a call one time. Now, they didn't show up in my house, but they did call and they said, hey, do you have these guns? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And then that was the end of it. So maybe it was just like they have to do their due diligence and just say, hey, you know, this guy owns these guns or whatever. But them showing up, uh, that's that's kind of weird. I mean, like, what, what are they expecting to do? I mean, what, what, if you, what if you don't have the guns? Then what? What are they going to do then? I mean, you're not breaking the law. I guess then that's a, that's a different conversation. All right. The homeowner asked if he still needed to retrieve the rest of his firearms. The agent said it wasn't necessary to see any more. They apologized for the inconvenience, wished the homeowner a good night, and left. Okay. Invading my privacy. Looking back, the homeowner believes he was coerced into giving his consent for what was legally a search of his proper, property, even though no enforcement action was taken against him. Since the ATF agents did not have a search warrant, they lacked probable cause to obtain one. They had to rely on obtaining consent from the homeowner. When the courts consider consent, they look at the voluntariness, uh, whether consent was freely given or coerced. They also consider whether the defendant knew he had a right to refuse. Other factors like the time of day and the officer's demeanor and uniforms can also be considered by the court. In this case, they pushed hard. They were clearly in a hurry, and the threat that they might have to return was menacing. I was embarrassed, the homeowner said. My neighbor saw the whole thing. Guys in these police vests standing in my yard, I was really uncomfortable. I felt really confused, like I was in some way being accused of something, even though I didn't commit a crime. It was quite embarrassing. I knew they couldn't come in, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to get uh, put in some watch list. We just got new gun laws here. I didn't want them coming back again. I felt like they were invading my privacy. The resident agent in charge of ATF's Wilmington, Delaware field office did not return calls seeking comment for the story. Similarly, public information officers at both ATF's Baltimore Field Division and Washington, D.C. headquarters did not return calls 
or emails seeking comment. They lack, uh, this lack of accountability is certainly nothing new for the ATF. Delaware State Police uh, was also unwilling to discuss this investigation. It sounds like your questions would be more appropriately suited for ATF. Please contact them with questions you have about straw purchases of firearms, Sergeant Sturgis said in an email. The only insight into ATF's surprise home inspections was in a Washington Post story published July 22, 2021, in which Attorney General Merrick Garland announced that the Biden-Harris administration was targeting straw purchasers. Going forward, officials said U.S. attorney's offices and ATF agents will seek to prosecute more straw purchases, focusing not only on major cities, but also the neighboring towns and states that supply many of the guns used in crime, including along the Interstate 95 corridor and in Indiana, Nevada, and Arizona, the story states. Delaware State Police have a proven lack of respect for the Second Amendment. They were once caught maintaining a secret list of gun owners, even though state law required them to destroy firearms records after 60 days. They used the list to illegally thwart at least one firearms purchase. Pairing one of their troopers with the ATF was bound to produce a host of constitutional violations. It was only a matter of time. These type of warrantless investigations are known as knock and talks. They're usually a tool reserved for nar narcotics detectives, and they've always been constitutionally suspect. Police rely upon verbal skills and their power of persuasion to convince a homeowner to waive their Fourth Amendment rights and let them in. Unlike this case, there's usually no record of what the cops told the homeowner in order to gain access to the home. To be clear, if the ATF agents had probable cause to believe this home homeowner was actually a straw purchaser, they could have petitioned the court for a search warrant. They didn't have a shred of probable cause in this case. In fact, all they had was an internal email stating, make sure this guy has his guns. The homeowner lives in an upscale, affluent neighborhood, a factor that certainly played a role in the agent's plans. They were counting on the homeowner to let them in quickly, rather than risk a neighbor seeing the, L the three LEOs in tactical vests milling around in his front yard. The fact that neither the ATF nor the Delaware State Police were willing to answer questions, much less defend the actions of their officers speaks volumes. Both agencies mistakenly believe that if they ignore difficult questions that they'll go away. Best practices. The best person to stop a straw purchase is a well-trained gun dealer. John Clark of FFL Consultants has trained hundreds of gun dealers. Clark and business partner John Bacher crisscrossed the country to help dealers fight back against the Biden, uh, Biden's war on guns. Their mantra is, get it right the first time. Straw purchases are something we teach all of our FFLs to monitor for, Clark said. If someone wants to buy seven high points, all right, remember what I said earlier? They should ask why someone wants seven of the cheapest handguns they sell. The go golden rule is buy a gun and keep it for at least a year. That will keep you out of the sights of the ATF and law enforcement, he said. If you're buying and selling on the side, you should get licensed. Um, let's see. Clark was asked about the case. Two federal agents and a state trooper wearing tactical vests. Uh, they could have been a little bit more inconspicuous, he said, but that's the feds. So this particular article was made in part with help, obviously, from the Second Amendment Foundation. All right. And I just want to, you know, give them a shout out here because they helped uh, Dan with this article. This might have actually been their article and T-Tag just reposted it, but outstanding investigative journalism. And, you know, this is the kind of stuff we need. And this is a very scary precedence that this sets forth. I mean, it would be one thing if they showed up to your house, you know, let's just say in slacks and a T-shirt, dressed nice with their badge on clear display, not carrying a gun and, and just showed up, you know, hey, we're just here to talk. You know, if you want to talk to us, cool. Uh, we're just trying to, you know, going out and making a contact as law enforcement is a common thing, right? I mean, I know Hollywood makes this out to be, you know, this sort of crazy thing. But like you see in the movies and in, in popular culture, you know, well, I don't have to talk to you. I know my rights, that sort of thing. Well, well look, that's a thing. If they don't have a search warrant, you don't have to talk to them. Uh, now, obviously, as my grandmother said, you catch more flies with sugar than the other S word. Uh, however, you know, you have to think at what point are these people trying to entrap you? Are they trying to, you know, make you say something that they're going to use against you, right? Are they trying to look for strange sights, strange smells, uh, anything that they can possibly use as a tool to come back with more people and more force and with a warrant? So I want to just kind of quickly mention my, my talk with the FBI. It was very informal, 
Now, I'm not going to mention a few of the calls that I made, uh, but let's just say I know a few people who've trained the FBI in the past, okay? And I called him, and I'm like, look, I mean, is this normal for them to come out and, and make a contact or whatever? And it turns out that they've actually been contacting a crap ton of just average people because this witch hunt that is the January 6th proceedings, you know, they're turning this thing to a giant witch hunt and they're using every tiny little thing at their disposal to try and entrap people, okay? Now, um, you know, they're, they're hanging on by a thread and trying to, to seek out every little tiny thing. Well, their exact words to me, and I have everything recorded, and I'm never going to publish it out of respect for the, for the, the you know, the identities of these people. I mean, w one day maybe I will blur it out and publish it, but you know what? It's water under the bridge. But the thing is, though, you know, uh, they, they were like, well, you're really influential. You've got a lot of followers and everything like that. And, uh, you know, oh, we, we just figured that maybe you would know something about it. I mean, like, of course, they're trying to trying to kind of trap you into saying something stupid. OK, I mean, obviously, I didn't have anything to do with that. I was in South Georgia hunting deer. I was nowhere near D.C., much less, you know, anywhere near the capital. So it's just that's the scary. This is a scary thing. That's this type of stuff that they're doing right now. I mean, like with this ATF type stuff with, with them coming and knocking on doors now. Had the Delaware State Police not been there, all right, consider this. What if the Delaware State Police said, hey, you feds, y'all do what you want, but we're not coming with you. Like, you want to go talk to people? Or if they said, hey, not in our jurisdiction. Okay, you're not going to go talk to somebody unless we're with you. So why was a Delaware officer uh, with the two ATF agents, right? If the ATF agents are just handling federal business, then what does Delaware have to do with it? Unless it's just because it's their jurisdiction or whatever. So it's a very important thing I just want to mention as well. Your sheriff is one of the most important people in your community. All right. He is an elected official. You need to have a good relationship with your sheriff. You need to take who you elect a sheriff very seriously because your sheriff can tell the feds to take a hike. Right. The sheriff is a pretty dang powerful person in your community. OK. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of different emotions that float around when it comes to law enforcement and what their intentions are. And, you know, you see things like this and, and, and you say, well, you're an oath breaker. You, you do this, you do that. You know, why are you going around and harassing these people? And then there's people that would say, well, they're just doing their jobs. They're just doing what, what they were told to do. Well, yeah, so were the Nazis, right? The Nazis were just following orders too, weren't they? Right. I mean, that excuse doesn't work forever. I mean, eventually, if you're on the losing side of the situation, uh, you know, you eventually going to have to to come to terms for your actions and you're going to have to answer for your actions. And, you know, right now it's innocent. Right now it's just a simple door knock with no warrant. But what's next? Uh, a FISA court or some type of, you know, random red flag uh, phantom court that, you know, you're not even a party to what's going on. And then a, 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 a bunch of guys show up in an MRAP with MP5s and shoot your dogs in the front yard and say, hey, we're here to take your guns. Here's a warrant. And you don't even know what's going on. You don't know what you did. You don't know who you pissed off. You don't know who turned you in. That is why red flag laws are so scary. Right now, it's just dudes knocking on the door, asking simple questions and being cordial. Next, it's going to be dudes in tactical gear with MP5s and ARs and machine guns and shooting your dogs on sight. That's the issue. That's why we're worried about this kind of stuff, right? Like, and this was years ago when the ATF called me about a few pistols that I bought at one time. And my explanation to them, which is absolutely 110% correct, was like, look, I'm a YouTuber. You know, I, I buy a lot of guns. And yeah, sometimes I buy more than one pistol in one sitting because, you know, I, I do videos on these guns. And what I told them at the time, actually, I'm like, if you want to see <laughs> uh, the guns that I have, just watch my YouTube channel. And there you go. They're, they're all right there. I mean, and, and if it's on the channel, chances are I probably still got it, right? So, um, you know, and they were, they were satisfied with that answer. But, but that's a, a unique situation. Okay, you know, what they're looking for, just like the article said, they're looking for the people that are buying, you know, seven or ten high points. I mean, like, why are you going to buy ten high points? Why are you going to buy 12 Glocks? That sort of thing. Now, look, hey, you know, when I worked at Moss, okay, there were many situations where, you know, we would have, and it was usually the Koreans or the Asians, right? We'd have this little old Korean lady come in and say, I want to protect my store. No, no kidding, right? And, and usually it'd be maybe a younger man with her, a member of the family that would say, hey, you know, we want to get into some, in some guns to protect the store and everything like that. 
And uh, there's situations like that where folks will come in and buy a rifle, a shotgun, a couple of pistols, a few cases of ammo. You know, they're not going in and buying guns every other week or once a month. They just want to go in and take care of their defense needs in one sitting. And that's okay. It's all right for someone to buy a rifle, pistol, shotgun, multiple multiples. You can buy whatever you want. But just know that if you buy a lot of guns within a short period, that the FFL is likely going to turn it they're actually required to turn in a multi. And then when they do turn in that multi, yeah, depending on the law enforcement officers that are getting uh, a hold of that multi at the local PD, uh, it's usually sent to the local police department in the area. And it's and, and there's usually a pawn shop person uh, that usually uh, each police department will have an investigator that handles all the pawn shop stuff and all the used guns and all the, the multis and stuff. And they'll check those against databases to see if a uh, gun's been stolen. So like if you've pawned a stolen gun, for instance, they can take that data from the forms that the pawnbrokers send over and they can run it against their database to see if, uh, if anyone in the area has reported a gun stolen. So they use it for that purpose and that's actually to help you recover your guns, right? That's a meaningful reason for that to exist so that if you've been a victim of a crime, if your gun has been stolen, they'll help you recover your gun. That's how it's supposed to work. And then of course, you know, the multis get sent out and they can do anything they want with them at that point. They could take those multis and just put all the serial numbers, make, model, and all of your information into a database if they want. It's been proven that the ATF has been maintaining a database of which they're not supposed to be maintaining. So there's all these strange uncertainties that are you know, sort of bubbling up and boiling over to, you know, the frog is in the pot and it's kind of warm right now and the, the water's starting to boil, but it's going to be a matter of time before the frog's going to get boiled. And, and I'm, I'm worried it's going to get to that point. I mean, as you know, uh, Stephen Diddlebach uh, just was confirmed as a new, you know, ATF director. Uh, so, you know, he has a known agenda uh, that we, we all, of course, we're, we're trying not to get him confirmed and we were all applying pressure uh, to the Senate, not to confirm him, but of course you can see he's confirmed now. Now you know that David Chipman, uh, you know his confirmation was was saw right through in terms of you know him. He was a known activist. Uh, Diddlebox records a little more opaque. However, he does have a known you know political side that he has chosen, and it's not the side of freedom. And he has already said that he's going to do a lot more things. And this is just part of the tip of that sword that the ATF is going to try to drive in everybody's backs of trying to, you know, use their power or their influence or their threat of force or threat of whatever threats uh, that they think they need to do to put someone under duress to give them what they want. So here's the thing. I'm not a legal authority, right? I'm not a lawyer. I'm not trying to tell you what to do or what not to do if someone shows up to your home. Uh, but just know that if they don't have a warrant, you don't have to talk to them. You can respectfully just... Don't answer the door. That's what what most lawyers would probably tell you to do is not to answer the door at all, right? Turn your ring bell on and record what they're saying. So if you get if they if they say something while they're on your front steps, even if you don't answer the door, you'll have a record of it, right? So I would say just avoid contact. Don't answer the door. Don't talk to them. If they have a warrant, trust me, they're going to let you know they have a warrant. But if they're just there to talk, it's just no different than the Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on your freaking door. OK, and, and that's just that's the bottom line. All right. Uh, you don't have to talk to them, but just bear in mind that, you know, they might come back with a, <laughs> with a warrant. But the thing is, they'd have a warrant if they had a reason to get it. Right. And simply purchasing a couple you know, multiple firearms is not reason enough for a judge to sign off on a warrant, a search warrant over something like that. It's a common practice. It's common for people to buy multiple guns. I mean, that it is what it is. So. I just thought this was a great article, and I wanted to share it. And, uh, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg, y'all. This is going to get worse if we don't put a stop to it. Um, we're going to talk about some other things in some future article reads. I'm, I'm about to read some more articles here uh, for future videos. But we're going to go over a couple of things related to Chevron deference, which I think, because of this Bruin case that just went through the Supreme Court, is going to have some really interesting implications to what the ATF can and cannot do. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Have yourselves a great day. Go over to Ballistic Inc. and pick yourself up a snazzy new t-shirt. That's one way that you can support our efforts. Don't forget, if you're looking for a career in gunsmithing, go check out SDI. The link is in the description box below. They're really awesome people, and they do a great job of helping to support my channel and to help me put out videos like this for you. 
Have a great day. Many more on the way. We'll see you soon.